Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT, and former Scotland skipper, ex Claremont scrum half, Greg Laidlaw is joining us shortly as well to look ahead to a massive clash between Scotland and France in Paris this weekend. But we should apologise, shouldn't we, Johnny, for not releasing an episode last week? Was it a case of Your morning... Fault. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely not. But we'll come to that. Was there a case of mourning France's first defeat in this how long, or or celebrating the fact that Scotland have actually won a couple of games back to back? Oh, mate, it was just work got in the way, um, which okay. is really boring. Um, and shouldn't really be excuse because we should bake this into how we live our lives. We should be able to podcast. But I went over after watching. Scotland thrash a crap Wales, which was some game that was for Finn Russell and the boys. Um, I was in London for a three-day conference with World Rugby, which was great and interesting and fun. I had to listen to Jim Hamilton talk utter pish about getting rid of scrums and revolutionising the game. <laughs> he managed Fuck to my... take his microphone with him. Why didn't you? Uh, uh, just amateur, completely amateur. But that was it. Three days in London. And then by the time we got back here, it was... I actually flew straight to Bilbao down to Spain mm. uh, to meet Jen and the kids for a family holiday. Um, she had the hour and a half drive south herself, which she absolutely loved. Um, and that was why, essentially, we didn't get one in last week. So mate, it was a good weekend of rugby. Scotland flying high, France winning their, or losing their first one. Um, but yeah, we'll do a better job. We will do better in future is what we'll do, Tim. And you had to go straight to Bilbao to make up for the fact that you were living life in London for three days over Valentine's Day, yeah? <laughs> well, essentially, but then I, I tried to, so in moving out, basically our work closed on Wednesday at five o'clock and the only flight out was at five o'clock from Stansted to Biarritz. And they were like, well, mate, you, can, you can't leave. And I was like, yeah, you're right, I can't leave. So the only <laughs> other flight to get out and meet everyone, there isn't a flight to Biarritz on the Thursday. We were heading to Bilbao as a family that was already booked in, so I just flew straight there. Um, to which everyone was absolutely delighted. I'm not going to lie. My wife really enjoyed the drive. She was delighted to see me after being away from home for eight, nine days. We had a great time in Bilbao. And she went off to a spa and said, here's three kids. Essentially, that's exactly yes. what happened. She got herself four <laughs> litres of sangria um, and I babysat for three days. You mentioned the rugby. We will look ahead to France Scotland in a minute, but you have to look back to look forward. So what did you make of France's defeat in Dublin and where does it rank for you because obviously there has been a conversation about the best mm. Six Nations games ever uh, I think if you're going to go down that's the way to go down throwing the ball around enjoying it challenging I, I think it's weird because it's not the France that we've seen over no. the past 24 months it's not what we've seen from Fabian Galti and Sean Edwards in the sort of pragmatic sometimes accused of being almost boring in style but throwing caution to the wind, trying to hold on to ball. I think there's maybe an understanding that if you're going to beat Ireland and the ball's going to be in play for a long period of time, it's better to have the ball. Because if Ireland have got the ball, you're struggling. Because we understand how effective their attack is. They're number one in the world for a reason. Um, and so, you know, some of it was a little bit frustrating to watch in that I didn't know what was happening and this wasn't what I was used to. But then I kind of admired a little bit of the caution to the wind and let's push it. Ireland have got two, three men in the backfield. We're numbers up a little bit. The result being one of the best tries. Again, we saw Duhan van der Merv two weekends ago against them. England at Twickenham. This weekend, you get playing out of 22, bad passing, but a willingness to push the ball. Like, fob it on, smack it. Tom Ramos has done it to lose time and time again. Push the ball to space, and we end up seeing Damian Peno and Anthony Jolange creating one of the best tries that we'll see in the tournament. So, bizarre. But I loved it. And the quality that we saw when both teams had ball in hand throughout the game was outstanding. Um, so, yeah, it has been mentioned. One of the best that we have seen. Um, incredible to watch. Um, but that's what you get when you get two sides that don't want to kick out, want to keep the ball on the field, want to keep ball in hand, enjoy their structures, execute well. Um, it was a phenomenal game to watch. And that keeping the ball on the field with the the kicking game, and I mean, at times they were playing out from their own twenty two as well. Is that yeah. was that a strategy to beat Ireland on that day? Do you think, or is there an element of, as you say, they have been quite pragmatic over the past eighteen months, and they feel a need to be a bit more expansive and to develop their game with a view to the World Cup? It's interesting. I mean, there's not many sides that I I think that France would say actually were better because they're so good defensively. That's the thing. So the challenge for me was, was our strength, which historically hasn't been something France has been good at. It hasn't been defense. It hasn't been exits. But now they actually are 
very good. They exit very well. They've got a big defensive line. They're good on the deck. I think maybe there might have been even shreds of doubt after Italy in that if Italy can do that and they can ragdoll us and we can give away that number of penalties, what are Ireland going to do? Therefore, maybe we need to hold on to the ball. I'm not sure if it's maybe the story of the past two weeks as opposed to the past two years, um, which is bizarre. Um, but going forward, I think if you're going to challenge at a World Cup, certainly what we've seen from t- sides that have won is like you're looking at New Zealand historically, looking at South Africa, is low risk in your own third. New Zealand kicked more than the other side. You think of South Africa in 2007, the way that they kicked and punished. I think they'll revert to that. I think we'll see it this weekend as well against Scotland, where it will be a revert to power, uh, trying to dominate collisions. And if they can't, then you go along and on and you pressurize and you force Scotland to play out, which is what they've done in the past. Um, but yeah, it was really bizarre, really bizarre to watch it unfold in the choice of strategy. But then we saw afterwards in the clips, Fabian Galti saying we're playing too much. So I still don't know, and we have, it hasn't come out in the wash, whether it was the players taking the game by the scruff of the neck and saying, well, this we've been given license to do this, so let's try it. Um, or whether it was Fabian saying, this is how we're going to set our stall out, this is what we need to do. Um, but look, in any case, in terms of the on-field, what we got to see, it was intriguing. Will they do that again this weekend? I doubt it. Um, so I think it might have been a one-off and how do we beat Ireland? That was the way and it didn't quite work. And you mentioned Sean Edwards was furious after the number of penalties they conceded against Italy. That game against Ireland, only the second time one of his teams have conceded four or more tries in 77 games in the Six Nations, which is an incredible record. So what will training have been like the last week and a half with him? Do you know what? I think for Sean, there'll be a bit of respect for the side that he was coaching against in that he understands that they are the number one side in the world. I mean, he he will be internally split because he will be furious. He has an incredible record and he doesn't like getting beaten. He doesn't like getting beaten up and to concede four tries for him is, is a big personal loss. But there also has to be a little bit of respect. You could say Ireland left a couple of tries out there as well. I, I know James Lowe's was contentious and that one's awarded, but there's a couple of opportunities that they could have also got across the white watch and actually chalked up a bigger score. So I think Sean will be, he'll recognize the fact that he came up against an Andy Farrell side that is flying, is number one side in the world. With ball in hand, they're incredibly difficult to stop. Uh, There's been a few different changes as well to personnel and and things that haven't quite been settled, but a little bit of frustration, but also I think you'll have a big amount of respect for the side that they played against and some of the rugby that Ireland threw together because they were insane. And they say you learn more in defeat than in victory. I suppose yeah. France obviously were doing their best to win the game. They wouldn't have wanted to lose it. But given the bigger picture, is it a kind of wake-up call that France might look back on and and think that was almost a, a good defeat, if you can say that? Yeah, well, I think they'll take the learning points. Um, in terms of will they play like that from deep against a side like Ireland again? I don't think so. Um you compare that again, you compare it directly with Ireland and what they've done in between World Cup cycles and that they've peaked and they've absolutely flourished and then come to crunch time, they've lost the key games at the World Cup. I think Fabian, if you could flick it, obviously he wants to win the Six Nations and he would have loved a Grand Slam. It's not going to happen, but I think there'll be learning points to take out of that game that you carry forward with a squad and you learn together. Got to remember, they've only been together 18 months. You look at like a Scotland, they're going to play this weekend and Gregor Townsend's been there through a, a cycle and a half of World Cup already um, and it's almost only now you can see they're hard baked and what they want to do they're so settled in their structures that everything looks easy um, and for France I think there's still some room for growth like they've won a Grand Slam last year looked a little bit sticky for them against Italy Ireland again first loss in a long run um, but the learnings will be good it's a side they're not invincible they now know that they're going to get the backing in their first home game in the tournament against Scotland this weekend. So I think they'll be looking forward to getting back to Paris this weekend. They'll be doing their prep down the road from Ian Capriton this weekend. I think there will have been a bit of brutality as well in the prep that they've done. Like you mentioned, Sean Edwards, you mentioned Fabian, um, even from the refs that they're helping them and the way they run things. I think that there will be an urgency now um, to get this back on track um, and they'll be aiming for a big win this weekend against Scotland. Let's turn our attention to that game now then and get our guest on. France's dreams of back-to-back Grand Slams might be over, but Scotland are dreaming of their own Grand Slam, Johnny. And we can have a chat with former Scotland captain, Greg Laidlaw. How you doing? Very well, thanks, guys. Uh, great to join you again. And uh, obviously a great start to the, the comp for Scotland. So looking forward to, to getting into it tonight. 
Absolutely unprecedented this in the Six Nations era. So how does it feel to be going into round three with those Grand Slam dreams still alive? Uh, to be fair to the team, you know, ex- excellent result, wasn't it? Uh, week one down in, down in Twickenham. Um, you know, it was a solid performance against probably, you know, a, an England team that played well in parts in that game. Um, and Scotland done really well after after going behind, I think it was 20 points to 12 at one point, to, to claw their way back into the game and get back in front again. And then, um, and I fancy this to beat Wales, to be quite honest, at home, which... Which was excellent to see, and, and the boys won con- convincingly as well, which was which was a good thing, and uh, just to see them have that sort of you know level level headed approach to the game and, and a real sort of professional effort, and you know so it sets us up uh, obviously nicely and very exciting uh, heading over to Paris uh, this coming weekend. I don't know why, but why were England and Wales not that bad when we played Greek? Why all of a sudden <laughs> now, <laughs> or is it Scotland that have got good? I don't know, but like there's definitely a sense that. They've played against two teams that are a little bit unsure of themselves. Like I don't, I can't remember last seeing England that average at Twickenham, and I can't recall seeing a Welsh Welsh side in that amount of disarray. I think now we can accept that Scotland have to play against the number two team in the world and Ireland as well the following week. But realistically, Scotland going to Paris this weekend. What do you think their chances are playing against the number two side in the world? Well, I think they're going to be confident and quietly confident, uh, Johnny. I think they're going to. They'll definitely understand the task at hand. Uh, you know, France have been excellent over the last, uh, you know, year, year and a half. They've really set the sort of precedent in the Northern Hemisphere alongside Ireland. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I guess, in many ways for Scotland, uh, France being beaten last weekend is, is probably not the best thing for us because th- this is a massive game now for France because, you know, after that defeat away from home, um, you know, they'll be very much looking forward to, to bounce back now. And, you know, they them losing an island and leading into that World Cup, you know, I, I don't think they'll be too bothered about that one. It almost takes a little bit of pressure off themselves. I don't think they would be wanting to go into the World Cup, you know, having won, you know, 18 or 19 test matches on the bounce, put it that way. But uh, they'll be real focused on bouncing back this weekend. But, you know, Scotland go over there with confidence, mate. Definitely, they've been playing well. And do you think that Scotland have got the ability to do what Ireland did to France? Do you think we're going to see a crazy ball in time amount? How do you think they'll approach it tactically? Oh, that'll be the game plan. I think you've seen from the first two weeks uh, or two two rounds of games even, that, that that's the way Scotland play, play their rugby, first and foremost. But they'll be smart about it as well, mate. And I think the, the way that, that Ireland, uh, you know, took that game away from France in many aspects, you've got to stop their momentum. You know, first and foremost, as you'll know, from you know playing big men and France probably plays slightly differently to, to everybody else a little bit in terms of just the way they gain momentum. They they play off the cuff a little bit more. You know, in around that ruck where it's you know Dupont just picking the ball up, having a go, and or one of their big forwards and uh, you know slipping an offload and and they kind of try and play through that channel one, channel two at times, and and if you allow them to slip the offloads in in that area to to create that speed of playing around there. That's when France become dangerous. So, if Scotland can shut them down there and and, and get their their own attack going, then definitely we can cause them problems again. And we spoke to Bernard Jackman before the Ireland France game, and he said basically the the only way that Ireland is scared of France is that sheer size at the scrum, that kind of thing. Didn't transpire in that game. There were only five scrums in the whole game. Clearly, it's about sort of how you play it. But is that still a a thing in the back of Scotland's minds that when they come up against sides that are physically huge, that could be their issue. Well, it's one of the challenges, Tim. Definitely, you know, for, from a, a Scottish side, it probably always has been, to be honest, because we we probably don't produce naturally, you know, massive athletes. But you know, having said that, I think you know we've got you know Xander's back fit. I think VP Nell has been doing a fantastic job on the tight head, um, and and somebody like Richie Gray. You know, back in there, and I've always I've said it all along. He's a Test match rugby player, and you know, and simple things, a lot of things that people won't see. He made such a big difference, whether that's winning, you know, easy, easier line out ball, or you know, whether he, using his weight, his size, and the scrum just just to help the pack, and, and and you know, all that hidden work, just cleaning rucks, and he does a lot of the dirty work. So he's been massive part of the, you know, that that Scottish pack, and 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 they'll use his experience this weekend as well from. You know, having spent so long in in, uh, in Toulouse and in Cast as well, you know, alongside you know Finn's experience as well, and and that's another you know asset that Scotland can really hold on to this weekend. I guess to 
probably a respect in many ways that, that Finn holds in, in that part of the world. Do you think that helps at the moment that Finn's over there as well, sort of tactically, because he's such a obviously massive part of Scotland's approach to the game that he plays against these players week in, week out? Oh, it definitely helps. And it'll help in the fact that the French guys know how, how good he is as well. Uh, you know, and, and that's, I guess that in many ways as well, that that's another strength of Scotland's team at the moment is, you know, maybe that week one against England, you know, Finn was solid. He, he wasn't outstanding, but other players stood up round about him. And, and you know, almost that sort of dovetail effect uh, at this moment in time, you're sort of seeing is, you know, Finn has a solid game. You know, somebody like Duan van der Merve, you know, stepping up and, and really setting things on fire. And, and it was almost the other way around, you know, going back to, to Murrayfield last weekend, Finn was on fire and, and all the other boys around the bottom were, were solid. Uh, you know, so as long as we keep doing that, uh, because Finn's he's obviously going to be heavily marked as as he was down in down in Twickenham, but but that's again the maturity he's shown in his game as well because he's just done the simple things really well, uh, you know, put the ball through his hands a couple of times, and then you know even against Wales a couple of lovely kicks, both you know crossfield kicks kicks into the backfield and he's just dangerous all around and it's it's excellent you know back seeing him enjoying himself in a, in a Scotland jersey. How do you think the kick strategy will work this weekend, Greg? Like somebody that's played halfback and stepped in at 10 as well for Scotland. We saw quite a bit of kicking in Ireland, France. How do you think Scotland will try and break up the game and target France with kick strategy this weekend? Yeah, I think they'll Scotland will go into the game and, and they'll say, you know, let's be real patient early in the game. Uh, you know, if France kick long to us, for example, I would imagine Scotland will look to kick long back and almost just, you know, put the ball back down there and say to France, you know, we're going to have 13 in the front line almost run it if you dare and it might be you know what it's like it, it, test matches can get a bit like that especially early in the game and um, I don't think Scotland will, will look to kick the ball out very very often if at all you know unless obviously you got that you know 50-22 option clearly they're, they're going to look for it then but you know clear in their own zone they'll probably look to keep the ball in uh, you know contest in there uh, you know get that get that ball in playtime high and, and, and really try and test France over that 80 minute period will, will probably be their game plan. And a certain Jonathan Dante is back fit now. Johnny, is Finn going to have him running down his channel or are France going to stick? Yeah. Uh, so he, he's back four weeks early, which is incredible from a big knee tear in December. So he got through game time again for La Rochelle at the weekend. So he's back in operation on fit. I think he's been drafted to the squad that's preparing about five minutes down the road from my place, Greek and Cap Breton. Um, so he's back with the squad. Whether he goes straight back in and starts I don't know but certainly you know the level of physicality go forward that he brings uh, Finn's a man obviously knows him very well from the top 14 and they've had a few decent clashes over the past couple of seasons so look it's maybe something that's missing a little bit from France is just that focal point and that gain line we talk about the collisions all the time and, and France dominate physically then they get go forward then it's open gate so if you're Fabian and you've got the chance to bring him back in and start him I reckon you probably do Um and that's it. If you can threaten and take away a little bit of Scotland's time on the ball and make it difficult for them, I'd say traditionally, like we mentioned at the start, that's where we've struggled. So he's back, he's fit. I hope he doesn't get picked, but uh, I think he probably is going to get picked this weekend. And Greg, Scotland showed a couple of years ago that they can win in Paris. Uh, Greg has turned around what was a dreadful away record for Scotland. I don't think they won a game outside of Rome, away from home in the Six Nations for about a decade between 2010 and 2020. That's been different in recent years. So is there, there's no longer a kind of fear factor, is there, when Scotland go away to France or away to England, that they, they know they can win? Yeah, they do. And that's that's obviously hugely important, um, you know, both, both from with, within the team um, and obviously, you know, other teams as well, they, they now know that as well. So I think, you know, the fact that they've, they've done it again in, in this year's Six Nations, um, you know, I'll, I'll really help them uh, against. Obviously, it's it's a new setup in England, but uh, Scotland deserve to win the game. And in England, have got some great players. So that, now that they don't, they shouldn't be fearful at all. You know, two from two in the championship. So Scotland got to go over there with, with a lot of confidence. But you know, and they they will do this. But they've got to understand the challenge that's facing them as well. That it's going to be a a hugely motivated French team. You know, they've probably. They're probably talking about that World Cup a little bit, you know, along the way, as, as well as the Six Nations, you know, building that momentum now. They're playing at home, Stade de France. They're going to be facing France there, uh, you know, eh, facing New Zealand there, sorry, in that first game of the, the World Cup, which is going to be awesome. So, 
you know, all their little things now are, are going to add up. And, you know, I'm sure France will be looking to start the, the, the game with, with a bang, I'm sure. Was there a mental block, Johnny, in the past when you were playing when Scotland went away all from right, home? Mate. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking was, hell. Was it just on the pitch or was it was it in your head? Genuinely, every time we went and played together, Greg and I, or we played in a Scotland jersey, you went away working your arse off and hoping to win and expecting to win and believing you were going to win. Only when you look back now at the record, you realise how shit we are and we can laugh. But... <laughs> Like we won away to Ireland, we should have won in Wales. Remember that game where we were amazing for seventy-four minutes, and then all hell broke loose. We should have won away in South Africa, but Jim had tried to shove Evan Elizabeth in the face and cost us the game. Like <laughs> we just shot ourselves in the foot all the time. But we went away believing we were going, or I certainly believed that we could win wherever we went. I love playing away from home, but it's only now when you look back at the record, you're like, holy shit! Like we make this generation now look bloody good because we were absolutely. <laughs> useless and um, but then that must be the beauty of it now for these boys is a way to twickenham doesn't make a difference a way to paris absolutely no fear not that i felt there was fear but certainly i think as time goes on and builds there's almost a fuck there's so much scarcity and there's nothing we've won nothing so what chances there are of us winning whereas for this these boys now they're used to winning at home they're used to winning away there should be no um no lack of confidence anyway, but thanks for that, Tim. Absolutely thrown under the bus. <laughs> On a more positive note, Greg, <laughs> as, as a former scrum half, give us an appre- appreciation for Antoine Dupont. And also on the flip side, if you were up against him this weekend, how'd you stop him? Oh, well, he's, he's awesome, isn't he? Let, let's be honest. He's, he's world class. He's, he's a lovely guy as well, to be fair to him. Yeah, anytime I've you know, come across him, he's you know, very humble and... Uh, sadly, they, they pipped us in the 2019 uh, top 14 final, which I still remember. That's that's about the only game I think back on. And uh, you know, wish we'd have won, but there we go. Uh, none, uh, none, of the Sc- none of the Scotland games. It's just that one that you look back. <laughs> ah, <on>. well, a <laughs> couple of Scotland games, mate, but, you know, the top 14 final is pretty special, mate, as well. It is. Uh, nah, turning back to Antoine, excellent, obviously player. He's yeah, the sort of talisman or. Uh, at the moment in in France uh, and rightly so, and I think he's he's obviously speed, but a lot of people don't talk about his power. He's got excellent power. He's he's kind of got you know low center of gravity, um, and as I mentioned before, that you know next to the rucks, that sort of channel one, channel two, he he makes a lot of breaks in there, and a lot of times you know the big forwards they go high on, on the smaller guy because I think they're they're just going to sort of smother him. And his, his ability to chuck that quick hand off into the chest and you know, and either break himself or get his hands free and offload. Um, you know, he's second to none. And you know, you've got to watch him for the whole time he's on the field, because if, if he sniffs half a half a gap, you know, he's gonna go for it. And and that's almost the, the strength of the, the team because they know that's how he likes to play. And you know, there's somebody there's a player right there next to him, you know, whether that's uh, you know, Cedo uh, Bay or, or somebody like that who, you know, plays at the same club as him and, and they're almost on the same page. So yeah, he's going to have to be marked tightly. Uh, he does all the simple things really well as well, but almost the same kind of when you, if you're going to be marking Finn, you know, trust your system, don't go out of the system, uh, you know, defend him in twos and threes. And you do that, you've got the best chance of, of keeping him in check. But, you know, he, he's going to have uh, hot moments in the game as well. How ridiculous is his kicking game? This is something nobody talks about. But the fact that he kicks the way he does off his right and his left, like, can you think of anyone else that can do that? Oh, not as comfortable as as, as he looks uh, doing it, Johnny. To be fair, he's he's pretty awesome. You know, he, he lines up on that. You know, normally, his right side, and if there's you know sort of the tall timbers in there, look at the play. He just spins around Thanks. and and bangs that way off the left, mate, and, and nobody seems to pick up on it. It's like oh, that's quite a good skill, uh, you know, to have, and he, he can bang it along. He can kick it contestable. So now nah, he's he's a marvelous player to watch, and you know you can see he's. Uh, He's enjoying himself, I guess, in that French team. So yeah, that's going to be one of the, the challenges Scotland are going to face this weekend. That's an area of the game you're interested in from a coaching point of view, right, Greg, as well as uh, as a player. Did, did you practice that in training? Do you, would you teach that to scrum halves moving forwards? Yeah, definitely. I think it's, you know, it, well, one, it looks good, doesn't it? But <laughs> two, it's, uh, no, nah, it comes in real handy because, you know, as we talked about, part of the game now is that kick pressure and, if you can, you know, force halfbacks to kick a little bit long, and you can give your catchers a bit of time, it, it takes that contest and it takes that slow ruck away, and that's one of the hardest rucks to attack off. So I think, you know, if 
if, if you're a young halfback now, yeah, definitely kicking off both feet to you know get away from that kick pressure if you can. And, and as I said, it's it's awesome to watch and it's extremely skillful. He's obviously spent a lot of time, uh, you know, practicing. Another man that I've been really impressed with is Scottish skipper Jamie Ritchie. Like as a former Scottish skipper yourself, what have you made of him? Like his arms must be sore from lifting all lifting all the silverware that he's got through already. But like you're in the job a long time, he's fresh into it right at the start. What have you made of him so far and what advice would you give him? Well, I'm just enjoying him play, uh, to be honest, uh, Johnny, and, and play well. And I think he's, you know, he's a, he's a quiet leader, uh, you know, which is fine um, because he just, you know, he goes about his his work uh, on the field and, you know, he'll have, he'll have his moments, but he'll he'll have his, uh, you know, his leaders round about him in, in that team and that sort of collective leadership. That's that's probably very much Jamie's style and he, he'll speak when he, when he thinks he needs to speak yeah, only, um, and he's a he's a guy who's he's probably got an old head and young shoulders, um, you know, so to speak. He's he's very balanced, uh, and I think it was very telling after that the victory down in, in Twickenham, you know, the way he spoke already, you know, talking about you know, yeah, it's excellent we've won, but you know we've got Wales next weekend, um, and I think that's sort of spreading throughout the group at the moment, and, and he's definitely got the respect of the. The group, so yeah, it's awesome to see him, uh, you know, grow as a, as a player and a, and a captain, and yeah, he's doing a fantastic job. And Scotland are going really well in this tournament. But speaking about them more generally, how do you look back on Gregor's time in charge? Obviously, it's not over yet, but so far, because he's been in charge for a while now, and they're playing some really good rugby. They score a lot of tries. He's got a great win ratio in terms of a lot of his predecessors. But a pool stage exit at the last World Cup, I think his first year in charge is the only time Scotland have finished in the top half of the Six Nations table. Clearly, we hope they do this year. How do you reflect on his time in charge generally? Um, well, I think he's he'll have learned a lot, uh, you know, along the way. I think he, you know, first coming into the job, there was a lot of talk about you know playing the, the, the sort of fastest rugby in the world, as it was dubbed at the time, and you know, what does that really mean? And you know that that was hard to to sort of see what that looked like, and so I think he's probably learned a lot. Um, in you know he's had a long time in the job now, which helps obviously. Um, you know work out what Test match rugby is. I think yeah, Steve Tandy coming in. I think he he's been good for for Scotland as well uh, in terms of just uh, probably a new voice, um, as well after the last World Cup. So I think. Uh, you know, and he, he's done a good job. Um, you know, I think it's it's awesome. He's he's brought a couple of older guys uh, back in. I mentioned Richie Gray earlier, and I think he's he's made a real difference uh, to the team. He's he's just a you know a canny player, as, as we would say in Scotland. He he goes around, he does his work, doesn't make many mistakes. So, and and once you know Gregor's teams they get on a roll, they, they do have a lot of confidence because the way they the way Gregor trains the team, you know, he puts them under pressure, uh, puts the, the skill sets under pressure. And you know that that second try uh, down in Twickenham almost uh, encapsulates the kind of the way Scotland train really. You know, keep the ball in play, grind teams down with with their skill set and our, and our fitness. So you know he's got them on the right track at, at this moment in time, which is great to see. Mate, the style is enjoyable. Like, I'm, like, the jury is still not not the jury's still out, but like until something tangible is won, you're never going to be able to say it's a full success because that's what success. Looks like that's what he'll judge himself on. That's what he'll want to win. Um, that being said, they've now got a chip and a chair. This is the best chance we've ever had. It's the first time since 96 we've won two on the trot, the opening two games. You go to Paris, and again, we talked about it earlier, but it's the same old questions for Scotland is when you're playing against big, brutal sides like a South Africa, like a France, it's that brute physicality. Can we either learn to deal with it and match it and achieve parity and then you create 50 50s and we take more of them and convert than France do is our skill set is good enough as it has been in the past two weekends to go and do that in the Stade de France or do you get bullied physically and, and you're not losing the game because of mall and scrum and that type of stuff um so I don't know like on a personal level I was only ever coached by Gregor when he was just the attack coach under Andy Robinson. And this is like early 2010s, that sort of era. And he didn't really get that much time with us. It was purely with the three-quarter line or with Grieg. So we never saw him. But I remember sitting in one of his first meetings and he said, and this is where like when Scott, we were a mess. Like we had no organization, no structure, didn't know what we we're doing on the field. And he sat down and said, right, lads, I reckon there's five or six ways that we can play you can play through defenses over defenses round defenses and we're just going to take you through five ten minutes of and he built this really good presentation i was like holy shit 
the Scottish coach like knows what he's talking. And then Andy was like, right, that's enough of that, Gregor. We're going to move on. And we're all like, oh, no, no more. And that was it. That was the last involvement that I really had with Gregor as an assistant coach. And I never really got to spend any time. And I thought it would be great with a guy with that depth and that knowledge and a wider view of the game of templates and organizations and structure. How do you go about holding on to the ball and beating teams? And that's now what we see with Scotland is that you go toe to toe with the All Blacks, you put 50 on Argentina. Granted, they were they got a red card after 15, 20 minutes. And now with other teams sort of not quite sure of themselves, but we've got conviction and we know what we're doing, you can put them away. Um, and that's the big challenge now is first and second in the world, Ireland, France, teams that are fairly sure of themselves, that's where you're judged. You're going up now against the best. How will you fare away from home in Paris? You've done it, gone back to back from COVID to the real day at Twickenham. Can you go and do it in Paris against a French side that's number two in the world? And they'll be full of belief in themselves and the way they've played in the past year. So can Scotland have that blend of the physicality required and take their key opportunities? And it's difficult, you know, for, for Scotland to, you know, to, to win a Six Nations. Uh, you know, history will prove that even a even a Five Nations. You know, we didn't win a you know a huge amount of them and. You know, it's it's every every so often, and you know we get a great team together, or you know things just align, and you know you look at maybe Wales at the minute, and it's taken nothing away from Scotland's victory, but that that is that a team at their end of the end of the cycle, you know maybe uh, is Scotland Scotland are going really well, certainly they're not at the end of the, their cycle, and just that overall picture of you know people saying you know Scotland have not won the Six Nations and stuff and. Yeah, we've not, but you know, we got to look at the bigger picture sometimes in terms of the, the playing numbers, you know, all that stuff. That it all comes into it. You know, for me, we're such a small country, and a lot of the times we do punch above our weight. And in the past, you know, we've probably picked up a few injuries at bad times for for the Scotland team, you know, and that's hurt us badly in the past. So, and hopefully now we've been able to build a little bit more depth as well, um, you know, and then that's when you're going to need that that depth and. Uh, in support of, of players that can step in and do a job and when you go away to, to Stade de France this coming weekend. I like that you could see how good a coach Gregor was early on, Johnny, but you just weren't allowed you can to tell. Them. They were They were like, just push, Johnny. We'll let him deal with Greg. You, your time's done. Off you go. <laughs> Next. <laughs> um, but, that's, but you can tell when somebody comes in and they have... Like Greg and I like roomed together when we were 16 and you can tell somebody has an understanding and an internal drive... I want to do well, but they also understand the game. And there's some people you just have that chat with and it clicks. And Gregor was one of those blokes that I got very little time with, but the way he spoke about rugby excited me. The way he had a vision for the game excited me and I could see that he would be able to create something for a team that could facilitate good positive play. The same conversation that you'd have with Fabian Galtier in the first two months at Montpellier and you're like, right, shit, this is going to work. This is good. And then the rugby is good. And that is what Gregor has brought to Scotland. And Fabian and Gregor are obviously in opposite coaching benches this weekend. It looks like Gregor is going to leave after the World Cup. Not confirmed yet, but it looks like he is. He has been approached about becoming an assistant coach to Fabian Gauthier with French. Given that he's been head coach of Scotland for so long, can you see him taking up a role like that, Greg, or not? I probably could. I think he's... He's as Johnny kind of alluded to. He's he's a coach that's probably he thinks outside the box a little bit in in many ways. Um, and I know he's, you know, from talking to him about playing in France and stuff. He obviously played down there for for a number of years himself, and you know he really enjoyed that that time in in his career as a player. And uh, you know it's almost hard not to enjoy you know playing over in France in terms of, you know going to the stadiums top fourteen. It, it's an awesome thing to be involved in, and I think. I definitely think that's something Gregor would consider. I mean, whether it, you know, I don't know if he's gonna gonna leave or not, but or the, you know, there's rumors flying about and what have you. But and it's the nature of the beast as well. You know, if, if he's you know out of contract, you know, he's you know a lot of people are saying oh, I shouldn't be doing this and that, but you know, he's he's allowed to you know look for a job essentially if, if he wants one. And I think he's uh, something like that would you know really float his boat and and really challenge him as as a coach and an individual, which. You know, I'm knowing, knowing on the way I do, you know, that, that's something you'd probably look at, yeah. It'd be fair to say his stock has risen as well. You, you know, from if you flick back to a year ago, it was way more in certain times, but Scotland now, like, getting through autumn, winning the first two, like, to be going off contract, I know he'll be judged on 
ultimately Six Nations, the outcome, and then the World Cup. But externally, the brand of rugby, the showcase that Scotland are playing at the minute, it's attractive. And people want like an attractive brand of winning rugby at the rugby club. So I don't think he'll be short of an offer to either. Like The weird thing is, for me now, having Gregor been the head coach for such a long period of time, is would it be weird to then go back to being an assistant? Like, I don't know the mentality of going back to being second choice or having enjoying a part of play in that control, but having controlled an entire performance remit, the whole thing for the best part of a decade, would it then be a side or backward step to go to another international side in a second language for an alternative choice, but have way less control? I could see him, if he doesn't sign on again with Scotland, taking a director of rugby or head coach role, you know, full-time day-to-day, the way he was at Glasgow Warriors, but potentially a challenge in France. Why not? Like he's bilingual, he's a Francophile, like you said, Greg, he loved his time over here. Would he not want to take up the head of a big French top 14 side? I think he probably would. Yeah, I, th- I think he, he probably would as, as well, Johnny. And in terms of that, I think the I think the international stuff probably intrigues him. So, you know, since he's been involved in it now for, for such a long time, he's he's probably got the taste of that now and he's probably got the balance right in terms of in terms of his coaching and as much as he's, you know, you're really busy, obviously, as, as a coach and Gregor, you know, he's, he studies a lot of the game and, and stuff, you know, that international coaching, yeah, it's intense when you're in it, but you know, there's a lot of times you're out of it as well and you, you get probably a little bit more downtime over the piece. So, you know, I guess it's it comes down to a little bit more life balance as well. If you go into a, a top 14 club director of rugby, a premiership director of rugby, whatever it is now, it's, that's a year long job, you know. I mean, in time you put recruitment and stuff, uh, you know, into it as well. You're under the pump, uh, for for a lot of the year. So, I think you'll you'll definitely look at a few different options. But it wouldn't surprise me if if he was to to move on. Uh, you know, you'd potentially end up in France. A quick one on your old position with Scotland, Greg, at scrum half. Obviously, there's enough players competing for that shirt as it is, and I know you've been outspoken in the past on so-called project players, this is a bit different, but there's a certain John Cooney who qualifies for Scotland in a few days' time as he won his last Ireland Caps three years ago. Gregor is reportedly interested, so would you have him in the Scotland squad or not? Um, no, I probably wouldn't. Um, I think I think we've got excellent scrum halves in, in the country as it is, um, I think you know Ben White's been excellent. Um, you know, obviously Ali's, um, you know, going through a, you know, that phase of he's obviously been dropped. So he, you know, be looking f- to to try and force his way back in. I think, um, you know, George Horn's been exciting off the bench uh, over over the last couple of weeks. But you know, I think we've got real excellent scrum halves underneath that as well. And I think. For me, it just sends the wrong message. You know, I talked about a little bit earlier on when I was talking about the Six Nations and it's hard and, you know, we've not won many times, but that's where we've got to really encourage our young players to, to be the best they can play, the best they can be, sorry. So you look at like a, a Jamie Dobby, a, um, a Ben Velicott, Charlie Shield, some of these guys are at Edinburgh and Glasgow, you know, excellent young scrum halves. And, you know, if we go out now and we pick... You know somebody that's you know played for another country. Uh, you know just three years ago, um, and, and he's not young. You know that, that's the thing for me. You know we've got to we've got to always be pushing, looking to the future. Uh, you know looking at our young players, looking at our, our systems in, in Edinburgh and Glasgow, and and as much as we want them to be successful, you know but we want young Scottish players pushing through in in, in the national team. Um, and, you know that's just my opinion on it. It's a weird one, right? Because I was reading an article the other day. I I agree with you. You have to push internally. Greg and I both came through a system that is a small country, as we mentioned. But you look back at, well, the team we have now and you compare it with the team that won the Five Nations in 1999. And you've got like the Leslie brothers from Lower Hutt. You've got Glenn Metcalf. You've got half a bunch of English. But like, it's the blend, I guess, that we're after. Then you flick forward to now and you've got your Duhans. You've got two Pilotus qualifying through um, his mum. You've got Hugh Jones, born in Edinburgh. But I think part of the beauty of it as well is that we do have to reach quite far because we're such a small country. But as far as we can internally, let's drive as, as much as we can. Make it people coming from your towns that are Scottish, that believe in it, and then a smattering that helps. Like I think that has to be the point. Whereas when you parachute people in, 
Like I even like the bizarre one for me was commentating on the game um Scotland Australia in the autumn and you had Jack Dempsey who yeah. you know 14 caps for the Wallabies and then all of a sudden he's lining up singing Flower of Scotland against the Wallabies and you're like it must be internally for him there's a part of me that I don't know if it's situational so because you've decided to leave and come to Glasgow Warriors because um it's a decent contract or you just wanted a change in like things you don't go to Glasgow for Quality of you're life, not moving to Glasgow. You're not moving to Glasgow for the fun of it, Johnny. Do you, do you know what I mean? So then, is it purely a financial? People are incentivized to come over to Europe, and then because you're there, oh well, if I get a chance to play, I should just do it. Or is it a real internal drive? That that's why I've always struggled with. Is that if it's genuinely something you come over and it's an internal drive, and that's what you want to do. And bizarrely, since the rules were tweaked and you could requalify, like, I won't name names, but I've had about fifteen people come out to me and say, can you connect me with the Scottish rugby coaching staff because I've got a mother from, or I actually grew up in a kilt or, and you know, but they've ended up <laughs> playing in a different country. It's bizarre, but that's the weird thing. And then you talk about the quality of rugby we're playing at the minute. It makes it more attractive to be part of, and you can be part of that international scene. You want to be there, but it goes back to the, what is your reason for being? And it should be to form people from your own country to represent that national side. And it to mean a little bit more. I think that's what it should probably mean. Yeah, I think so. And there's great examples um, in terms of, you know, you know, Ireland. Uh, I think have done an excellent job. You know, Wales over recent years, not big countries either, but you know, obviously more people playing the game than, than in Scotland because, um, you know, certainly Wales rugby is the main sport. Uh, but you know, but other teams do do it as well. You know, you know, Ireland have got you know James Lowe, Jameson Gibson Park. You know, players are obviously not grown up there as well, so they, so they do have them. Scotland. You know, as you've mentioned, Johnny, we probably in the past have, have stretched further, but you know, we probably need to, you know, at times uh, because because that that pool is is so small. So, but it's it's also great to see Scotland in the twenties as well, just at the moment, just to give them a little bit of a wrap and you know, just that it's just to see it's it's not just the you know the Scottish uh, uh, men's team, you know, also the, the women qualified for the the World Cup uh, just in New Zealand there as well. Um, you know, Scotland in the twenties. Um, good win against Wales, um, also in a, in a close one against England. So you know, and, and I think it just it's it's a really good thing for the the countries to look at. And certainly for me as a ex Scotland captain, it, it's awesome to look back and, and see the you know just under that national team that, that things are are going pretty well. Also, and you've got to judge it on a case by case basis as well, right? There's a big difference between a Hugh Jones, Sione Tupolotu, and a Jack Dempsey, and potentially John Cooney. That they're kind of not exploiting the rules are there to be to be used but they, those tweaks in world rugby's eligibility laws were supposed to be to help tier two nations and those are examples of players going from tier one country to tier one country so it's very different but also interesting to hear johnny that that you're it's your fault basically you're you're hooking 15 players at mcgregor for the world cup are you? <laughs> well he's obviously <laughs> said no hasn't he because none of them have pitched up <laughs> um, no, it's it's been it has been interesting, and that's it. It's because, and again, I'm not sure, but it comes down to one person's choice. It's case by case, but it's that one coach that's in charge of every single country that gets to make that decision. So, weirdly, without naming names, there have been players that have contacted me, um, and there's been for other nations as well. It's not just been Scotland who I would choose on like a performance level to slot into the team, but they haven't been taken by the coach. So super interesting, but is is the coach's prerogative to do what they want to do with their side? If he feels that's what it needs there and then, he's gone with it. And some people have been like McConaughey as well. The English um, has just gone over to Scotland. There's another example who somebody who grew up Scottish, dad is very Scottish, and has just been picked back up by the wider squad after getting a couple of England caps. But like weirdly, it was for Pacific Island nations. Like this is what it's all been brought in is to help lower tier. And to strengthen them. And I think come World Cup time, given there's one or two jumping about to Scotland, I think Tonga will be stronger for the fact that they have a whole handful of players that are world class, that are yeah. going under the radar. And then they're going to arrive at the World Cup and absolutely explode. That's the exciting bit is the PI nations who have got their talent back. So it's weird we're, we're debating Scotland and, and the couple of people that have been picked up. But really, the big help is going to be, oh, I think there's going to be a couple of big upsets at the World Cup because two two nations are going to be absolutely flying. Tonga are in uh, Scotland's pool, Johnny. You know that, mate. So, yep, I know. That's, that's, that's exactly that's why that's I said they're not too good, mate. But they've got some uh, 
pretty awesome players, that's for sure. But that's it. Everyone's talking about, you know, Scotland, Ireland and South Africa, three top five ranked now nations. It should never happen. I'm like, nobody's talking about Tonga. It's like people haven't looked through their roster and looked through who they who they've got mm. back now. Um, and I think that could be an absolute wild card as well for a quarterfinal that nobody sees coming. But um, hopefully they don't be Scotland. That's all I'm saying. And before we let you go, Greg, uh, you're playing with Izzy Falau, uh, Liam Gill, other overseas stars in Japan. Uh, you've been there quite a while now, so it's obviously going well. Oh, well, listen, it's uh, having great fun. Uh, Tim, for sure, it's it's completely different, obviously, and uh, you know I, I sort of knew that. And as long as you come in with your eyes open, you know you, you don't get too many shocks, and and that's you know fortunately for uh, you know myself, uh, Rachel, my wife, she's she's been excellent as well, and w- which really helps. And yeah, it, it's just a completely different place to to come and experience for for a few years, and you know both on the rugby side and and that life experience. Um, you know, obviously, I'm not getting any younger, but. And so that life experience has been awesome as well. Uh, but yeah, having great fun. Um, you've got a, a good bunch of foreign boys, you know, here at the club. And there's a lot of foreign boys uh, out here in Japan as well. That you're able to catch up with or, or bump into as well. And, uh, and the league's getting stronger and stronger as well. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a, hopefully a good time to be involved in, in rugby in Japan. And you were just saying before we record as well with the new eligibility laws, you're looking forward to hopefully representing Japan at some point in the near future. No? <laughs> <laughs> Johnny, I'm a true blood mate. You should know that by uh, now. <laughs> I know. I know, but I couldn't yeah. resist. You'll see me Johnny... play for Scotland, mate, before I play for Japan again. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny's revealed he's an agent working with Gregor, trying to pass him foreigners from all over the world to play for Scotland. Are you doing the opposite? There's rumours that Stuart Hogg could be heading there after the World Cup. Have you spoken <laughs> to him? Have you advised him? Oh, <laughs> Well, you got to be careful. You see, I've done one article when I, I mentioned I'd spoken to Hoggy. La- lazy. Just yeah. say, Greg. You just say that's yeah. lazy journalism, Tim. Yeah. Meeting a lazy you, journalist. You Hoggy spoke to him about whiskey. <laughs> yeah, he I spoke, spoke to him about life in general oh. as a mate. And, and then next minute, you know, I, you know, Greg Laidlaw says Hoggy's coming to Japan. And, <laughs> Hoggy, and, then from, and poor Hoggy's getting slaughtered by the Exeter supporters, I think it was. And I, and I clearly said he's, he's still in contract there in Exeter. So... Uh, as far as I'm aware, he's he's in contract in Exeter. He's happy down there, um, you know. And then Hoggy will decide what he decides uh, when that time comes for him. But first and foremost for him, he's closing on a hundred caps. Uh, you know, for Scotland, touch where he stays injury free. He's, he's been awesome, and uh, you know we're going to need him again this weekend. He's had a couple of electrifying result um, performances in Scotland jersey over the years, and he's hoping uh, there's a few more few more left for him. And if he does it in the Six Nations, hopefully it'll, it'll help us out. We can put that one to bed and you can just lure him over to France instead, Johnny. Fingers crossed. I'll be the agent over <laughs> here, don't worry. <laughs> Greg, before you go, give us a prediction this weekend. Give us a score. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, Sean Edwards will, will have the French fired up in terms of you know that defence. It's going to be tight, but I think over the 80 minutes... It, if we get it right, Scotland going to have to get it right over eighty minutes to to have any chance of winning. Uh, oof, I'll, I'll pull something out of the hat. I don't know. 20, 22 18 to Scotland. I'll say that's. I don't know where I pulled that from. Mate. It's it's going to be a hard game. At your arse. Uh, that's where you pull it from. Yeah, yeah, I'm arse, mate. So if we can score one more point than them, mate, I'll be happy. He said that with such confidence. I like it. Yeah, it's going to be a tough game, but. I truly believe if, if they get it right over 80 minutes, they, they could come close to winning. So uh, time will tell. Cheers, Greg. Really appreciate it. Good to see you enjoying Japan as well. Cheers, guys. Thanks, mate. Greg's confident, Johnny. Are you? For France or for Scotland? Um, <laughs> uh, he's confident and he's optimistic, but I think for Scotland, it's a level up this weekend. Um, I feel like Scotland have played against... They've played well, don't get me wrong, but they've played against... England, who are unsure, Wales, who are in complete disarray, let's be honest, in a total tailspin, you're now coming up against a different beast, which is a French side that, although has been a little bit shaky in the first two games, has enough resource, has enough strength physically, and I think mentally, um, to get back home for their first home game and give it a real a real big one. Um, so they'll be looking forward to getting home in front of their public. Um 
and teeing off their competition. I think that's the dangerous bit for Scotland is that this is a real reception for France getting back to the Stade de France with an expectant crowd and an expectant bunch of players who will expect to knock over Scotland. So um, he's confident. Um, I'm not so confident. Right, we'll touch briefly on the top 14 shortly. But first, let's find out what your meter moment of the week is. comes from Toulon this weekend, mate. Um and we don't have many meter moment of the weeks with Toulon. Um, their fans were all absolutely raging that another game had been moved to the velodrome to host Toulouse at the weekend. It was a bit of a stuffy encounter, scrappy as well. Um, a little bit of a shame as well for our old mate Sergio Parise, who's been on the show a couple of times, lost his father really recently, decided to play the game, uh, and then got red carded early on and was in floods of tears. Um, so like disappointing for him, but a team that rallied around him and culminated in a last-minute gasp win. They were down to 14 the entire way through the game, effectively, and Baptiste Saran came up with something out of absolutely nothing with about five minutes to go and won the game and buried it. So a huge moment for Baptiste Saran, who's pushing to get back into the French side as well. Disappointment for Sergio Parise, but an important four points for Toulon, who've been struggling this season. I guess them climbing even further up in the top six as well. So a huge moment for Baptiste Saran. One of the most outrageous dummies you'll see in the top 14. If you can get on YouTube, find it. Their match from the weekend. He sold about three of their players down a river, ducked under and won the game for Toulon. And so Baptiste Saran is our meter moment of the week. There we go. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer. Recently making over 20 million cooks better with their game-changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven or in a pan. And you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can get 10% off any full price item. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout. That's FRENCHPOD10, and you'll get 10% off any full price item at meter.com. We mentioned the finish to the game with Toulon. Also, mm-hmm. a dramatic ending for Bayonne, Johnny. Nip and tuck the whole way. Stade Francais came down to Bayonne, and Stade Francais is still second. Again, we talked about them at the start of the season. We weren't sure, but under Gonzalo Quesada, mate, they're playing and they're playing some really good stuff. That's probably the closest shave Bayonne have had at home as well, but they are still the only team not to have lost a game at home in the top 14. They're sixth with probably the smallest budget. Um, Cami Lopez, again, the hero. He had some wayward moments, but to knock over the penalty last minute and win the game after Stade Francais had come back with a try um, three minutes before injury time. Um, another huge win for Bayonne. Like, incredible when you think of their budget, um, what they've managed to do. Perpignan as well with a massive win. They chalked up 50 points against Poe in an absolute thriller in Perpignan. And some of the tries, young Tristan Tedder, who I played with mm. at Bayonne, who's moving to Stade Francais next season as a 10-15. He was absolutely phenomenal. Um, great athlete. Great to see his development as well. Um, but yeah, 50 points for Perpignan. Second bottom. Um and yeah, starting to climb. Breve now 14th, four points off Perpignan. Um, that was a huge bonus point win for Perpignan. Really important for them. You mentioned Gonzalo Casada. We've spoken about him quite a bit this season because we've known for a while he's off at the end of the season. Yeah, he's still doing wonders with Stade Francais. Yep. Reports in some quarters in France that he might be lined up to join the French coaching staff. Maybe if Gregor doesn't get it, who knows? Yeah, I thought it was Gregor Townsend. Um, <laughs> who knows? Look, it's weird because Semperé, the forwards coach, he's already signed on to do the forwards job. So maybe there's been some sort of communication behind the scenes. Look, well, if you're coming, like come with me and go and do this together. I, I don't know. I think there'll be quite a few names chucked around before now in the World Cup. Like the strange thing is, there's a bit of a rotation going on with the coaches, but there's not that many coaches or top level coaches available at the minute. Um, there's even rumors down in cast that they, because of poor form, cast are down to Levant, which is really unlike mm. them with the budget they have, maybe looking to get rid of Pierre Henri Broncon. Uh, their coach, Jeremy Davidson, reportedly coming in. But again, reports coming out of cast and like I've spoken to different people at Bordeaux and the sort of coaching rotation there is at the minute, there aren't many coaches available this is the really strange thing so everybody has a spot nobody's looking to shift it's only if somebody gets fired you look at Christoph Urios who was sacked from Bordeaux timed things perfectly went to Clermont think for cast who's available who's ready now that's top class and ready to come in and do a job and and the honest answer is there aren't that many people so um Casada potentially to assistant coach with the French setup 
Jeremy Davidson reportedly in French press to take in, uh, to step in and take the role at cast. Um, but that's it. Beyond those guys, there aren't many free agents at the minute. And Montpellier lost at Lyon, a horrible incident involving Zach Mercer, clash of heads. Um, game was stopped for about 10 minutes, but he looks like he's okay. It was just one of those weird ones where you duck into a double tackle. Um, and Zach's strong point is with his footwork um, and his strength and his speed, he rarely gets caught in anything. Like he's so good with ball in hand, but there he's just got dinked at the wrong time, double collision. And again, to go off on a stretcher, you're thinking, oh shit, this looks really bad. Um, and that's it. The game was stopped 10 minutes, as you mentioned. I, I, the coming back now is the potential is only two to three weeks out, which would be, I mean, you don't want to say that's a positive because you want any time out, but going off on a stretcher and thinking the worst and a real bad collision or a real bad injury, um, hopefully he'll be back in a few weeks and he'll be right as rain. Thanks, Johnny. A big thanks to Greg Laidlaw for joining us and thanks to all you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe, leave us a nice review if you can. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Come on, Scotland, eh, Johnny? <laughs> Can we say that? I'm on the fence, mate. I'm looking forward to the game. <laughs> See you next week. Cheers, Tim. Bye.